For the last couple months, I've been obsessed with an idea. And that idea is that there are still things out there in space that aren't known that can be discovered by people like you and me with our own telescopes. Most people think that NASA and all the astronomers of history have already noticed and found everything there is to see in the night sky, but this couldn't be further from the truth. What if I told you that I discovered my own nebula in the night sky that's larger than even the full moon is? This is the story about the discovery of Falls Object 1. So before I explain to you a bit more about this discovery, we have to back up and talk about what astrophotography is in general. Simply put, astrophotography is the act of pointing a camera up into the night sky and taking a photo. It can take many shapes and forms, but the way I and many other people choose to do it is to attach a camera to our telescope, point this telescope at the sky, use a tracking mount to allow us to track the motion of the night sky and to take many long exposures of galaxies, nebulae, stars, anything you can think of in the night sky. Everyone who picks up a telescope and looks through it with their eyes and yearns for more is inevitably drawn down this path where they realize the human eye cannot really see that much in the night sky. However, if you hook up a camera to the telescope instead of your eyeball, suddenly a whole vast world of bright colors, faint nebulae, star clusters, and faint galaxies as far as you could imagine becomes available to you. Most people will start out with a simple telescope for visual, or maybe they'll even start out with a simple DSLR camera and a lens. Either way, drive yourself outside of the city far away from any lights, and either of these tools will open up a whole new world that was invisible to your eye. Even just one exposure from a simple camera lens in DSLR can show you our entire Milky Way galaxy in just one shot. For many of us though, the novelty of just a camera and a lens simply isn't enough and we have to go bigger, we have to go deeper, we need larger telescopes. And so most people are drawn upon a path of slowly upgrading their gear. Commonly, people will upgrade to a, a small 80 millimeter telescope combined with some kind of a tracking mount. This will follow the rotation of the Earth and stabilize the movement of the night sky, allowing you to take super long exposures. And this basically means there's nothing in the universe that you can't really take a photo of. So over time, people will develop an intimate relationship with the night sky You'll go to all the famous places like the Orion Nebula, the Andromeda Galaxy, and you'll become familiar with this hidden world above your head. And it's really fantastic for the first couple of years. But as you get more and more into it, you're going to realize that there's a problem. And it's a creative problem. So the great thing with any other kind of photography is that a moment is different from day to day, from hour to hour. You can't ever revisit it and have it be the same. But this really isn't the case with astrophotography. Our subjects are still on the time scale of our whole lifespan. When we go look at the Andromeda Galaxy, it's the same as the day we looked at it before, the year we looked at it before, and the decade that we looked at it before. And this is in essence the problem. Everything is static, everything stays the same, and for this reason, everyone who does astrophotography is taking the same photo of the same thing over and over and over and over again. Now, there's nothing wrong with taking the exact same photo someone else has taken. You could maybe try and make your photo a bit better than someone else's, but you can see there's a fundamental creative struggle with astrophotography. How do you find something new how do you take a photo that hasn't been taken before? This is the big question. And this is the path that leads you down to discovery. There are new things out there. There are things that nobody has taken photos of. All you have to do is go looking and find them. You've decided to take the path less traveled. You want to find something no one else has seen before. How do you even start? How do you know if you've seen something new? This is a really important question when you go out looking for things. 
And this is one that you really can't answer without talking about my friends Marcel and Xavier. Early on in my obsession, I leaned heavily on my friends Marcel and Xavier for a bit of their guidance. They together have discovered over a hundred different planetary nebula and other objects in the nighttime sky, and pretty much anyone who thinks about discovering something new eventually ends up asking them for help, and they are always gracious enough to give plenty of advice, which I leaned on quite heavily. Namely, the issue of knowing whether or not you've actually found something new. This is a really big question. Marcel and Xavier tolerated me sending them many different things that I thought were new. Some things were very interesting objects that have never been photographed before, but were already known about. Other things were less interesting, and I even sent them a couple of lens flares that I thought were real nebula. So they tolerated a bunch of my shenanigans, and I learned the ropes of how to verify the novelty of a discovery from them, which is going to be a very important tool for me going forward. So now I've learned to tell the difference between what is new and what isn't. The last part of the question is where do you even point your telescope to find something new? And that's the big problem. Luckily though, I have a telescope that was very well suited to address this kind of problem. My particular telescope, a Takahashi FSQ 106, is one that I purchased with the intent to do panoramas. Doing a panorama in astrophotography is one of the hardest things you can do. You need long exposure, and if you have to divide that up amongst a series of panoramic photos, you spread yourself very thin with your exposure time. The more exposure time, the better. The scope I chose was optimized for this purpose, where I'm looking at wide fields of view and I'm collecting light incredibly quickly. Unintentionally, this proved to be exactly the type of telescope that I would need to go out and look for objects. In particular, when you're looking for faint things out there in space, you ideally want to be able to scan a large portion of the sky and you want to be able to do it very quick. And unintentionally, I had created a telescope system that was perfect for just this task. Since I have a telescope that can cover a huge portion of the sky very quickly, the strategy I chose upon for looking for objects is pretty dumb. I have just been pointing my telescope at random spots in the night sky. Sometimes I would look at things in a structured manner and follow a grid pattern, and other times I would just pick random spots to look at. I have always been struck by the belief that there are things out there everywhere in the sky to be discovered. You just literally have to go looking where no one else has gone looking. And that's what I decided to do one night in December. So on this particular evening, I decided to point my telescope at a semi-random spot. The spot sat between the Siegel Nebula and the Rosette Nebula in a region of space where there are no famous objects and nobody is really pointing their telescope to take photos there. Now, this part of the sky was still in the central part of the Milky Way, so there's a high density of stars and perhaps a high likelihood for nebulae to be forming there. You see, the types of nebulas we're looking for require some types of stars to create them. They either need to be white dwarf stars in the center of a planetary nebula where a star will shed its outer layers and the gas will become ionized and start to glow, or we just need to find a hot enough star that it ionizes the surrounding gas. Now, if you think about this, you're looking for stars essentially, and you need to be looking for where they are the most dense to have the best odds to find something. So this was a bit of my thought process. I should look somewhere where there's a high density of stars and not really in a place that's often looked at by other astrophotographers. But not only this, I needed to look in a particular filter that not a lot of other astrophotographers are using. And this filter is the oxygen three filter, which passes through light from doubly ionized oxygen atoms out in space. Now in astrophotography, there's three main filters that everyone else is looking through. There's the hydrogen alpha filter, the sulfur two filter, and the oxygen three filter. Professional astronomers have already taken great interest in the hydrogen alpha filter and have captured most of the night sky in this wavelength. So if you're going to look for something totally new in a place where they have already looked, 
it better not be in hydrogen alpha because it's probably already known about. On the other hand, sulfur two and oxygen three have no surveys in those filter bands, meaning there are no professionals, there's no NASA, there's no great map you can go look to to see where oxygen three is in the whole night sky. This doesn't exist. And this falls upon us to do ourselves if we want to look for new things. And this is a strategy I'm adopting where I will look specifically in oxygen three in a wavelength where no one else is looking. This will hopefully only show me new things. So on this particular night, I slapped on my oxygen three filter. I pointed at my target location and I let my telescope go for the night, falling asleep, not expecting too much the following morning. Now, when I woke up and compiled my data from the previous night, I noticed a smudge. Now, you see a lot of smudges when you go looking for them, but this smudge was different. I checked the catalogs to see if anyone knew about this particular smudge, and beyond my belief, this smudge was completely unknown. This is the moment. Now it's on. You found something new, totally new, and now you get to take a photo of it. Now the real fun began. I started collecting as much exposure time as I could on this object, and for the next three months, in between some severe weather in California, I managed to stack about 84 hours of exposure time. This is equivalent to over three days in pure darkness, and what I managed to capture was beyond my belief. What you're seeing here now is a star field. This star field is where false object one is located. If we start to unveil the gases captured by our narrowband filters, first we can see it in hydrogen alpha. There doesn't seem to be too much going on. It is just gas, there is no huge main structure. However, if we see what it looks like in oxygen three, all of a sudden the object is unveiled. Not much of anything is known about this nebula, but here's what we do know. It is about 4,000 light years away and about 58 light years wide. This makes it over 340 trillion miles wide, an exceptionally large nebula to be discovered. At its core lies what we believe to be a hot subdwarf type star. This is an extremely high temperature star, likely so hot that it is ionizing the surrounding gas, causing it to glow brightly in the oxygen three wavelength. In our night sky, this nebula is a little bit larger than even the full moon is. Part of the reason it wasn't detected until recently is because of its huge size. Because it's so large, it's so big that it doesn't really fit inside of the camera for many different professional observatories around the world. It can only really be seen in a wide field of view amateur telescope. So that was the whole story on how I discovered a nebula. I hope this inspires you to go out and explore for new things on your own. I hope you all enjoyed that video as much as I did making it. I wanted to take a second to let you know about some of the upcoming things I have going on. I have a couple astrophotography workshops coming up with my good friends, Derek Culver and Ian Lauer. So if you're interested in coming to join us on an epic stargazing adventure, then check the link in my bio, maybe uh, come along and discover something of your own while we're out taking photos. I also want to let you know that I have fine art prints of this image available on my website, and I've also got an astrophotography image processing course on my website. So if you're interested in helping to support the channel and maybe getting a little bit of art or learning how to edit your own astrophotos, feel free to check out my website. Uh, I've also got links to some telescopes I would recommend if you're just starting out in my description. So all of these things will help support the channel and help support the discovery efforts. I hope you all enjoyed the video and I'll catch you all in the next one.